I'd like to begin just to introduce myself. Uh, my name is David Corbett. I'm a product manager in the infrastructure section at uh, ProSec, which is uh, part of the Screening Eagle Technologies company now. Um, basically, we've been active for many years in non-destructive testing, um, particularly the area I'm involved in is concrete testing. I'm also active in various standards bodies, so European standards bodies. I'm a member of uh, RILEM and uh, participate in the ACI 228 committee, for those who know it, deals with all the non-destructive testing issues. And uh, yeah, that's me. You can see my email there. Uh, if there are any questions um, following this presentation, you're always free to contact me. You have a Q&A um, capability in Zoom and we'll be dealing with um, questions uh, and answers at the end. So any, any questions you may have during the presentation, just jot them down and we'll uh, try to deal with them after the presentation is over. So uh, let's begin. Um, when it comes to using ultrasonics for assessing concrete structures, the classical method which has been used for many years is uh, ultrasonic pulse velocity. It's related to the concrete density, it's related to concrete quality, and it's been used for many, many years uh, to, to carry out assessments of concrete structures. Why, why is UPV so popular for on-site assessment? Well, firstly, it's completely non-destructive. Uh, unlike other NDT methods, which are typically restricted to a surface measurement, it measures through the entire thickness of the element. It's been standardized worldwide. It's used for the check homogeneity of concrete quality, can also be correlated to compressive strength, you can also combine it with rebound hammer measurements using the SONREV method for improved compressive strength uh, estimates. So it's a very popular technique. As you can see, it's been standardized worldwide uh, for many years. So all, virtually every region has a standard for this test. And this highlights the importance of the test method. So a traditional UPV measurement, it's actually very simple. You know, we have two transducers, transmit and receive and a timing circuit. We transmit a signal from one to the other and we measure the transmission time. If we know the distance between the two transducers, we can calculate the pulse velocity. And for concrete, this is typically in the range 3,000 to 5,000 meters per second, depending on the concrete quality. This is for traditional longitudinal or P-wave transducers. And uh, here, the higher speed typically indicates a higher density, a higher, higher quality. The standards basically allow different measurement setups for UPV measurement. Um, the best one to use is the direct transmission. This is the optimum configuration. You can see we're measuring directly through the entire uh, element. It gives the maximum signal level, and it's the most accurate measurement of pulse velocity determination. If you can only access one side of the structure, then you may be forced to use the indirect transmission uh, method. But you can see the signal level, it's only a fraction of the level you would get with the direct um, measurement. And also, you should be aware that the pulse velocity determined by this method can be anything up to 20% lower than the pulse velocity you would determine by the direct transmission. These are figures taken from the British standard. Um, in between the two, you have the semi-direct transmission. So it's clear that um, if you really want to have meaningful results, it's necessary to have access from two sides. If we look at the on-site measurement, this is a typical measurement setup. You can see here, you need two people at least to do the measurement. You have to draw a grid on both sides of the structure. So you have quite a, a lot of preparation time. You have to try and align these grids as accurate, accurately as possible. One of the main parameters is the distance between the two elements. So if you don't align the grids properly, you're gonna affect the results. You have to coordinate uh, the operation 
between the two operators. I mean, in this particular example, it's not too bad. They can actually see each other. If you can imagine that that's a, a, a solid wall, then you can quickly understand there may be some communication issues. When to move to the next cell? Are you both on the correct grid location? This type of, uh, this type of effect. One of the operators has to view and record the measurements. It could be, depending on the structure you're testing, that you need very long cables. The longest cables that we supply are actually 30 meter cables and they have their own handling issues. And typically to have sufficient signal strength, you need to use a coupling gel. And this gel, you have to uh, replace very, well, reapply very frequently while you're doing the test. Once we've done the actual measurement, then we're in a position to do uh, a concrete quality classification. This is one example of how it's used I and mean, it's taken from a standard that's widely used in India. Uh, basically, they have four bands of pulse velocity bands, uh, which give a concrete quality gradient. So they do a lot of tests on each element. They do statistics and basically assign a concrete quality. So it's a very quick, it's a very simple way of giving a first level uh, estimation of the concrete quality. So now that was a brief introduction of actually how UPV is used, some of the issues you have with doing the measurement and uh, basically how it's used to assess concrete quality. I'd like to move on now to actually a major development in this test, which uh, was published last year. The European standard for determination of ultrasonic pulse velocity is this uh, EN12504-4. And there was a new amendment published to it last year. So what changed in the standard? Well, basically it allows the use of transverse or shear wave or S wave transducers. Previously, it, uh, like mo most of the other standards, it explicitly mentioned the use of longitudinal transducers, basically because that's all that was uh, previously available in years gone by. It also allows the measurement using the pulse echo mode. So why was the standard changed? Well, we've seen that when you only had single side access, previously, the only possibility was to do the surface wave measurement, which we've seen can be very inaccurate. It's also quite time consuming to perform if you do it uh, correctly as the standards recommend. Um, the pulse echo method can also be carried out when you have a single side access, but crucially, it actually measures through the entire thickness of the element. Also, transverse or S-wave transducers are now readily available, and pulse echo technology is also now readily available. And this was obviously not the case in years gone by. Um, the accuracy of the pulse echo method is more comparable with the direct measurement also. So this is really uh, a big advantage for users if they have to do a measurement from a single side. If we look at a comparison of the two methods, so I'm comparing now with the direct measurement. On the top, you can see the classical method. We have the transmitter and the receiver. I have coupling, and I'm actually measuring a P wave velocity, which in one way or another is used to assess the concrete quality. If I look at the pulse echo method below, I only need access from a single side. The signal is transmitted and reflected back to the same surface. I don't have any coupling, and I'm measuring S wave velocity. If I wish, I can convert this to a P wave velocity. And again, this can be used to assess the concrete quality in somewhere or another. If we look at the on-site measurement, it's actually significantly easier. You only need one person to do the measurement. So I only actually have to have a measurement grid on one side, a lot less preparation time. There are no coordination issues with a, a second operator. So there's no risk of being on different cells on the grid, for example. There are no cables involved, again, much easier, no handling issues, and I don't have any requirement for coupling gel. So if we consider all of these things together, you can see 
it's at least two times faster to perform this test than the traditional UPV measure measurement. Um, so now actually we've looked at the basically the reasons why this, this standard was amended. It brings real advantages to users. Um, and I'd like now to introduce how ProSec have um, basically implemented uh, a simple way to get the most out of this amendment uh, to the standard. And it's based on the Pundit PD8050 instrument used together with the Pundit Array app. The solution, it's actually based around uh, a new feature we've introduced, which is called the velocity tag. Basically, uh, Pulse Echo instruments were developed primarily as imaging systems, and they generate images using the synthetic aperture focusing technique or SAFT, which basically assumes a single pulse velocity uh, throughout the entire scan. So until now, in our instrument or any pulse echo instrument, uh, there's been one unique pulse velocity. And this uh, moving forward, we actually refer to this now as the global pulse velocity. And if we actually do a calibration of the pulse velocity using multiple echoes, as you can see on the left-hand side, this is what we determine. In order to record local pulse velocities at any location in the scan, we've introduced the velocity tag. And uh, to add a new tag, it's very simple. We do this in the same way as we add any other tag on the image. I can press and hold on the screen at the desired location. And then rather than selecting one of the, the structural tags, um, I actually select the pulse velocity tag. When the tag is created, it actually calculates um, a local depth based on the global pulse velocity because it doesn't know any different when I first created it. If I actually tap on the local depth in the information bar, I can actually enter the specific depth, which in this case is 250 millimeters. So the specific depth at that location. And when I do this, Basically, it generates this velocity tag, and you can say I can add as many tags as I wish throughout the scan, and the pulse velocity at that location is uh, indicated directly below the tag. I'd like to say a little bit about P waves and S waves. Um, everybody who's been doing a UPV test uh, until now will be familiar with P waves. Um, Pulse echo technology uses S waves, so I'd like to explain a little bit about the difference between the two. The terminology P and S wave, it actually comes from seismology. The P waves were the primary waves, S waves are the secondary waves, which cause the aftershocks. But P waves, basically, the particles which vibrate inside the uh, concrete, they vibrate in the same direction as the wave is traveling. For this reason, they're also called longitudinal waves or compression waves, P waves. Uh, you can see typical pulse velocities, we've said before, around about 4,000. The S waves or shear waves, it's uh, the particles vibrate uh, perpendicular to the direction of travel, travel. So transverse, that's why they're also called transverse waves, and they travel slower. 2,200, 2,300 meters per second are typical values. Um, as I've said, anybody who's been doing this test until now will be more familiar with P wave values as an indicator of concrete quality. But the P wave and the S wave, they're actually directly related by one of the elastic properties of any material. In our case, it's concrete. And this is the uh, quality called Poisson's ratio. So if we actually know Poisson's ratio, we can calculate the P wave velocity from the S wave velocity. If Poisson's ratio is known, we can actually enter this directly in the app. Um, I would say in 99% and probably more of the cases, this will not be the case. So we've actually made it easier for the user um, 
we've basically done a, a conversion based on compressive strength bands. So if you know the compressive strength of the concrete or which band it is, you can simply select this and it will assign a suitable Poisson's ratio value. And these values basically have been determined by empirical testing. And it's um, once I've actually done this, you can see in the pulse velocity tag information, I have the measured S wave velocity and I have an estimated P wave velocity. And again, this is just for reference because people are more familiar with P wave velocities uh, uh, until now. So going back to our concrete quality classification table that we looked at previously, you can see I have my four concrete quality classification bands. I have the P wave velocities, typical P wave velocities that you would expect for this, and then associated shear wave velocities. I said earlier also, uh, the S wave pulse velocity determined with this method, it can be used to correlate to compressive strength uh, and to determine compressive strength on site. In Europe, the standard which uh, tells you how to do this is EN13791. It defines a number of methods from just a, a normal correlation. This is another method which is defined in the standard, uh, which basically allows you is a combination of cause and um, non-destructive testing. You can see if you look at the bottom line, if I don't do any NDT, I have to take 10 cores to be able to assign a compressive strength class. And actually, even when you're doing this, it recommends the use of NDT to identify the core locations. If I actually combine with NDT, you can see here it's actually based on the volume of concrete I have here. Uh, if I take the top line, if I have 30 cubic meters of concrete, I have to do nine measurements uh, with my PD8050. So nine measurements, this is done in no time. I have to find the two locations with the lowest NDT result and I take only two cores. And based on this, I can assign a compressive strength class. So very useful, very quick way to reduce the amount of cores you need to take. Um, because UPV is completely non-destructive, and now we've seen it's actually much faster than it ever has been before, it makes it an ideal system for carrying out uniformity testing with a grid scan. And this is something we've implemented in the new app. We actually have two versions of the uh, grid scan. One is to look at depth variations. Um, and the new one now is actually to look at pulse velocity variations. And this type of representation, basically you can identify at a glance where you have a uh, problems in your structure. So I can look here in the bottom left hand corner, I have this red area. Very quickly, you get a, a, an image of where you may want to uh, pay more attention to the issues at hand. Um, to set up the grid, it's actually very easy. Uh, this is actually the app in action here. So I just drag on this symbol at the top right hand corner of the grid, I press and hold it. And I can drag it to any size to set the number of rows and columns. Alternatively, I can press and hold on this and set the number of rows and columns uh, manually just by typing them in. You can see the maximum grid size is 338 cells. I can set the size of each cell by tapping on this cross at the bottom corner and seeing how, how big the cell is. Um, in order to do a pulse velocity scan, I have to tell the app how thick the structure is. So I do this by tapping on the back wall depth and I can set the depth to whatever it is. I, should, I have to know this from the structure, otherwise I can't calculate the pulse velocity. Uh, when it comes to displaying it, we can display it with these al alphanumeric symbols or I can actually show the real grid dimensions. It's up to the user how he wishes to set this up. And when everything is done, basically, we can uh, confirm it and I'm ready to start testing. Okay, at default, uh, when on startup, the active cell is this cell A1 and it's indicated by this square. square. 
So on the structure, I should actually press my probe to the same location um, on, the, on the surface. So I, this grid corresponds to that. I get my real-time B-scan image. This is unique to our instrument. It allows me to adjust the, the amplitude, whatever, uh, when I'm ready. I save the measurement and it automatically jumps to the next cell. As you can see, the back wall is detected by our AI algorithm and it sets the velocity tag automatically. So basically, I can then quickly scan from cell to cell very quickly to get the pulse velocity measurements. If I actually come to a location where the AI algorithm cannot detect the back wall for any reason, if I press save now, nothing will be saved. It's up to me now to decide what to do. I can leave it like that and carry on, or I can go back to that cell by doing a long press there, and I can either delete the scan that's there, or I can scan it again. If I scan it again and get a good measurement, I can simply carry on with my scanning over the grid. Also, I may have locations where I want to skip some cells. Maybe there's a pipe on the wall, something like this. I can simply double tap in any other cell, make that the active cell, and uh, do the measurement. And of course, I could also go back to cells that I've missed earlier by double tapping and do the scan again there. Once I've recorded the value, it automatically jumps to the next free cell. So in this way, you can very quickly complete a grid scan. It should point out actually this real-time base scan. This is very useful because it actually allows you to see if you've got a good measurement before you actually save the measurement. So this is really crucial to the operation of this procedure. Um, we can see in the top right hand corner here, I'm getting some values which are much different from everywhere else. And I will come back to that in a moment. And when I finish the grid, basically I can just press stop. It asks me to confirm, have I finished the test? I can confirm or I can continue scanning. Maybe I want to go back and look at some cells I wasn't sure about and uh, rescan them. Okay. As we saw in that previous scan, I actually had an issue in the top right hand corner. And now I'd actually like to talk about another disadvantage of traditional UPV measurement. Um, normally in UPV, if I have an issue with the pulse velocity, I get a slow pulse velocity. It's, uh, that's normally uh, the most common issue you will have. But generally you have no way of knowing the reason for this. It could be something like this, that the signal has to travel around the void. It could be like on the right-hand side where I have a, a delamination. It has to travel around it. I have no way of knowing um, really what it is. If I measure in this location, I'll probably get no signal at all. Um, but basically, uh, you're working blind. So you don't really have any idea what is happening there without doing a lot of other measurements or a lot of further investigation. And this is actually now a major advantage of uh, UPV measurement using pulse echo. Because at each measurement location, we actually have an image of what's inside the concrete. I could even go back there and do a complete line scan and get really a lot of detailed information. Um, I can compare the image in these suspect cells with images from the surrounding cells and see what the differences are in this case. And here it's actually clear that in this top right hand corner, I have a major object um, that's given me an echo at around about 15 centimeters, so 150 millimeters. And um, that's actually something that uh, I would not necessarily know how to deal with this if I used a traditional UPV measurement. So it's really a major advantage of this technique. Um, if we look at the review mode now, once I've actually completed the scan, we actually have a number of um, methods for looking at and reviewing the data. Um, 
in this top right hand corner here in this one, I actually know that the depth at this location is actually 150 millimeters and not 250 millimeters. And that's why it's given me a very high pulse velocity. So I can actually simply go in there and I can adjust the local depth to the correct value and it will recalculate the pulse velocity. And um, I can do this for all the affected cells. And of course, this technique allows us also to handle non uniform objects. So provided I know the actual thickness at the specific location, I can, um, I can adjust it. Um, it's also possible uh, to look at particular cells. I can look at each cell, I see the scan. If I see something interesting, I can swipe down with two fingers and it takes me into the standard B scan mode. And here, basically, I can add additional tags if I wish. I mean, in this location, I wish to mark the presence of a rebar. So I can do that. If you had other objects, you can do it. You can also adjust the velocity tag if you think it's not correct um, manually. And when I swipe back to the main grid scan, you can see this information is still recorded there. Um, concrete classification with this method. As you can see, everything is color coded. Um, the color coding is adjusted. You can see there's a little symbol on the right hand side there with the, the three colors. If I look at this, uh, the Indian standard, you can see now if I bring up the color bar, basically I've got the breakpoints set to this classification. But of course, um, I can adjust these classifications to anything that I wish simply by dragging on the slider and adjusting the, the breakpoint. So in this way, you can set this, this, uh, this overview to whatever uh, values you wish. I also have data export possibilities here. So I can share this data with colleagues anywhere using either URL, HTML. If I save a snapshot, this actually generates an image of what's on the screen and saves it in the logbook to record. Or I can export as a snapshot. And if I export as a snapshot, uh, this generates a file which I can email to colleagues uh, however I wish. It also it creates a table um, that you can import into Excel, for example. So of all the tags I have in the system, so every, every cell has a tag. I have the transmission time information. I have the local pulse velocity information and the local depth information. So I can very quickly share this information with colleagues anywhere in the world, basically. A further possibility is to use our workspace. So this is actually on the, the screeningeagle.com website. Um, and it's actually free of charge. Basically, all of the data from any of my instruments, in this case, it's a PD8050, I have access to it there. So here you can see, I have a grid scan snapshot uh, with the information. I can click on this more tab, I can scan down. It gives me all the information about the instrument, the settings, everything that was done during the measurement. And again, at the bottom, I have all of this tag information. And from Workspace, I can also share this with colleagues. Um, I can export, very easy to work with. And this is free of charge for any of our subscribers. So um, just to wrap up, I'd like to go back and do a comparison of the, of the two methods, so traditional UPV measurement, pulse echo UPV measurement. So basically, I only need access from one side with Pulse Echo. I only need one person to do the test. I don't have the coupling gel. I don't have any handling issues with cables. I have a lot less preparation time because I only need a grid on one surface. I don't have any coordination issues with uh, a colleague. And one, possibly the most importantly of all, I'm not working blind. If I do have an issue with the pulse velocity, I actually have a lot of inf additional information that helps me to explain this. I actually have an image of what's inside the concrete. So all this together, uh, see, it's at least two times faster than the traditional, traditional method. 
So that was a quick overview of this technology. I hope you found it um, interesting. And uh, as I said, if you have any, any questions, we're happy to uh, try and answer them now. And I'll just put up my contact details, because if you prefer to ask your questions uh, after this presentation, you can contact me at any time. Um, okay, I've got a question here. The basic is, is it possible to display P wave velocities in the grid scan? Um, the grid scan actually displays the measured S wave values. Um, during our initial trials now, we've actually been de demonstrating and using this uh, technique in some countries in Europe. Uh, we've actually had the request to also be able to activate display P wave velocities. So we actually, uh, we're going to try and uh, implement this in one of the coming releases. And uh, anybody who has any of our products, you know, it's a subscription basis. So all of these upgrades are basically free of charge. Um, there's a question here from Atta Kureshi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, specify the difference between P wave and S wave and how they behave inside the structure. Um, I, I tried to explain this before. I mean, basically traditional ultrasonic Transducers have always been P wave transducers in the past. Uh, more recently, S wave transducers have become more available, and that's why it's now possible to do this measurement with this uh, technique. Uh, basically, it's just the way they, they transmit. P waves are faster, their, their particles vibrate in the same direction as travel. Uh, shear waves travel a little bit slower. They have some characteristics which make them better for imaging. Um, they're less affected by, for example, by water content. Um, it's, it makes the imaging systems better, but they travel slower and the particles vibrate perpendicular to the direction of travel. Um, there's a question by, I'll probably pronounce this wrong again, Wei Chong Tang. Will the scan be disturbed by a plastic sheet on the surface? Uh, the answer is yes. With ultrasonic signals, uh, any ultrasonic measurement, if you have a boundary between two objects, um, depending on the acoustic impedance of the two objects, you can get, uh, you know, it determines how much of the signal is reflected. Uh, with a plastic sheet, you get almost a total reflection. So this, it's not measured, it would not be possible to measure through a plastic sheet. Um, I have a question from uh, William Ward. Uh, what kind of file exports can we do from workspace for a grid scan? Basically, all of the um, all of the exports that you have in the app, you have also available uh, from workspace. Um, there's another question here. Do we need to update the existing ultrasonic pulse echo? Um, our previous version of this instrument was called the, the PD-8000. Um, the app, this is basically a new feature in the app. So anybody who has the subscription, they also have this possibility. Uh, all they have to do is upgrade the app. You don't have to upgrade the transducer. You can use it with the existing transducer. You have to upgrade the app and that's free of charge if you have the subscription. Um, there's another question of whether or not this applies to the Pundit 250 array. Uh, no, it doesn't. The Pundit 250 array basically uses the um, the platform. It does it, our, our old platform, uh, which doesn't have the processing power for this kind of functionality. That's actually one of the reasons we moved to the iPad. It's much more powerful. What you can do, though, is actually the same transducer that you have with the Pundit 250 array can be used with the with the new app. So. Um, we have a trading um, scheme at the moment and possibilities to work for Pundit 250 Ray users to move to, um, to the iPad version. So basically get in touch with your local uh, ProSec or Screening Eagle Technologies dealer and he will give you all the information you need to do that. Um, 
There's a question about how to differentiate between metallic and non-metallic from the scanned image. Um, this is more difficult. I mean, generally, you know this from, from um, knowledge of the structure. I mean, if you have rebars are typically more easy to identify because they come at regular levels. Similarly with um, things like uh, post-tension ducts, which can be easily detected with this technology. Uh, basically from the depth and the size you have the image. Things like voids and uh, delaminations tend to be much larger. So yeah, you generally have to use a knowledge of the structure to do this. Of course, uh, if it's things like voids, um, you get a much stronger reflection as well than you do from a metal object. Metal, you get a, um, you get maybe a, a partial reflection, you always say, maybe about 50% of the signal. Uh, if you have an air gap, so from a void or a delamination, you get a total reflection, so a much stronger image. Um, there's a question here. For pulse velocity, we have some limits in the standard to make the decision on the results. But what about pulse echo? Which standard should be referred? Again, right now, this has been introduced into the European standard. Um, this is the first standard to adapt adopt pulse echo technology. Uh, I've actually given some information here about how to decide the results. But generally, with ultrasonics, you do a correlation, for example, the compressive strength. And you can do a correlation of an S-wave velocity in exactly the same way as you do a correlation to a P-wave velocity. So there's really no um, difference in using the two. The only thing you shouldn't do is mix the two. Um, so that's actually, uh, use it in exactly the same way. Okay, can I comment on the degree of maintenance or spare parts of the equipment when working on concrete due to the sensors and surfaces? The, this type of sensor, basically they, they have sprung contacts, so it actually adapts to uh, rougher surfaces. Um, generally, we have very few issues with, with maintenance. Spare parts in the new system, we've made it actually very much, much simpler to replace um, transducer elements, for example. Um, it's a modular design now since we introduced the PD8050, so it's actually very, very simple matter to replace a transducer if it, if it ever went wrong. But basically, um, we, we have had very few issues with this. Um, okay, do you have a support team if we ever acquire this kind of equipment? Um, and basically talking about this from a customer in the Philippines, we do have an agent in the Philippines. Um, so I would say get in touch with the people there. They can definitely provide support. They're supported in turn from our, we have a major center in Singapore. Uh, which is, uh, I guess, responsible for handling Southeast Asia. Uh, so there is support available for using um, this uh, this equipment. And uh, I haven't been to the Philippines myself for quite a few years now, so I'm always. You can always feel free to invite me over. You know. Okay. Last question now: Can we upgrade point rate two fifty to eighty fifty? Um, basically, yes, you can, you can upgrade it. Like I said, it uses the same transducer. The, the, the transducer that you have with a Pundit Array 250 is, is the same transducer as the PD-8000. And the PD-8000 or the PD-8050 both uh, work together with this app. Otherwise, if you want to use the new transducer, the PD-8050 is the latest uh, design that's uh, the main the main developments on it were actually a modular design uh, to make it much easier uh, if you have maintenance issues. It's also significantly lighter, and that's a big thing when you're doing this test. I mean, the PD8050 is the lightest pulse echo transducer available on the market, and we have uh, we have a very attractive uh, scheme if you want to actually upgrade the PD8050. If you want to use your transducer from the Pundit 250 with the new app, you can do that as well. You just need to get a subscription for the app. So both of these possibilities are available. Um, 
that's the last question. I hope I've answered everything. As I said, you have my contact details. So if there are any questions that you would like to answer afterwards, feel free to contact me. Feel free to contact your local Screening Eagle agent or business unit, and uh, they will happy to provide you any information, um, any information you may wish. One last question. Can we use pulse echo and UPV transducer underwater? Um, unfortunately, not. The pulse echo transducer is not watertight. With traditional UPV, you uh, can have access to um, watertight transducers. And this, uh, I know several occasions that this has been done, but the pulse echo method uh, is not possible to use underwater. Okay, um, I think that's it. So thank you everybody for your attention. Um, I'm saying that nearly everybody stayed until the end. So uh, I'm very happy about that. And I hope uh, this has been very useful. So thank you very much. <laughs>